president comes in and he has to deal with the world like he found, finds it. It's not a terribly uh, friendly world. It's not a world where everyone believes what we believe. It's a world where there are other military powers besides the United States. He has to deal with what he has. Vintage Donald Rumsfeld right there appearing on ABC many Sundays ago in 1976 during his first tour as Secretary of Defense. His second, more turbulent Pentagon tour ended in 2006, after which Rumsfeld clammed up and went low profile. But now he's back answering his critics with a new book on the New York Times bestseller list. And I should note that all proceeds are going to military charities that support the wounded and the families of the fallen. Secretary Rumsfeld joins us again from Florida. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let's talk about your book. It's a bestseller and it's interesting, but there seem to, seems to be a, a common thread in the criticism. Bob Woodward of the Washington Post called it, quote, one big cleanup job, a brazen effort to shift blame to others, including President Bush, distort history, ignore the record, or simply avoid discussing matters that cannot be airbrushed away without making this a fight between you and Bob Woodward. How do you respond to the general criticism that you use this book to shift blame away from things that you were, were your responsibility? Well, first I'd say that the, the comment on the book has been all across the spectrum. A, a good deal of praise, and then there are people like Woodward who've criticized it. And I understand that. These are tough issues. It's a controversial set of subjects. I decided that unlike Woodward, who writes a book fast and doesn't have a dot website to document it, and talks to people who were not involved in the decisions in some cases, second and three layers down, uh, that's a different kind of a book. My book has over 1,300 endnotes. It has hundreds of footnotes. I have created a website that has over 3,500 primary source documents and other types of documents that support the book. So if someone reads the book, they can see a paragraph I've quoted from a memo and then go to the endnote and go right to the website and read the entire memo. This is a, an unusual book in the sense that it is fully documented. And I feel very good about it. Uh, I think that, that we've had something like 10 million hits on the website where serious people, rather than uh, criticizing, have gone to the website, tried to see what really took place, and began to see how tough those decisions are that all the easy decisions get made below the presidential level and, and that these decisions are inevitably going to be made by people. Uh, they're multidimensional. They are decisions that in many instances are made with imperfect information, in some cases even with inaccurate information. But I think it'll give historians and people seriously interested in these subjects a chance to see really what it was like on the inside, which is of course not the case with these books that are written by people who weren't there. All right, well, let, let's talk about some of the footnotes because I did go to www.romsfeld.com, the website you surprisingly just failed to, to, to name, uh, and, uh, and also uh, have read the book. And there was something that was very interesting, and that is this memo that you prepared before the war in Iraq in which you outlined all of the worst-case scenarios, the things that could go wrong. You didn't think they were going to go wrong, but they could go wrong. Uh, you called it the parade of horribles. One of the parade of horribles uh, in which you noted this risk about going to war in Iraq, quote, rather than having the post-Saddam effort require two to four years, it could take eight to ten years, thereby absorbing U.S. leadership, military, and financial resources. That was October 2002. Mm -hmm. And yet one month later, you said this. I can't tell you if a, the use of force in Iraq today would, would last five days or five weeks or five months. Uh, but, but it certainly isn't going to last any longer than that. Can you help us understand how I was, this memo sure. is talking about a two to four year plan uh, commitment or, or eight to ten, but publicly you were saying five weeks or five sure. months? Yes, I, I certainly can. I was talking about major, cop, uh, major combat operations and, and that lasted, I think, about four or five weeks. So it was not inaccurate. Uh, I said dozens of times, I said what I said earlier, where I agreed with uh, Secretary of Defense Bob Gates, that nobody can tell you about any war, how long it's going to last, how much it's going to cost, or how many lives are going to be lost. And every war is a terrible thing. Every war is a failure of foreign policy, the inability of governments to solve things in a peaceful way. And, and that parade, so-called parade of horribles, uh, I made, before the war started, I, I circulated it to the National Security Council and the President, and I felt that was my responsibility. It was to sit down and say to myself, 
okay, the president's decided he's going to move forward and invade Iraq and change the regime. And we've got a plan, and we know the plan changes with first contact with the enemy. And what are the things that conceivably can go differently? And so I made that list. And then I got other people to help me develop it. And then I sent it around to the president and the National Security Council. The other day I was on O'Reilly and he kept saying, well, why didn't we publicize the list? Well, that would be mindless to tell the enemy every conceivable thing we didn't want them to do, every conceivable thing they could do that w could complicate the problems for the United States and the coalition. But, but if I felt a responsibility that we look seriously at all of those. Fortunately, a lot of those terrible things that could have happened did not happen. Some of them did, to be sure.